Hey, everybody, it's Mark. I'm back with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before we get to our amazing guest this week, I also want to remind everybody that if you're interested in my Everest pursuits coming up in 2021, leaving March 31st, you can do so at www.markpattisonnfl.com. Uh, you can also find all the podcasts. We've got over 175 there now, the massive downloads, which I totally appreciate the love. And as always, please go in and give a ratings and review. It's not about me being popular. Of course, it's about all these inspirational people like we're going to talk about with today that help guide the way. And so the more exposure on iTunes, the more exposure you get in terms of viewability and what is out there in this gigantic sea of podcasts. Okay, so on that note, let's jump in. I've got an amazing guest. Um, It's a big catch for me. I've had a couple of actors on. This guy I've been following for a long time. Very, very interesting dude. His name is Tom Arnold. Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing well, buddy. How are you doing? Well, I, you know, I was looking back at your, 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 you know, you've got this amazing career and you've got over 50 films, all kinds of TV stuff going on. And I was asking, how in the hell does a guy from Iowa that at one point in time was working in a meat plant become this high Hollywood icon, you know, very well known. You've had these amazing projects. You've got a really wide, diverse range of things you've done. I mean, where, was it on the vision board when you're growing up, or how did that? How did you fall into all this stuff? <clears throat> the vision board. Well, you know, I grew up. I did grow up in a small uh, farming town, and oldest of seven kids. And uh, we did. Uh, you know, when you're a kid, when you're a kid from a tumble Iowa, you do have. You know, you have dreams. Uh, you know, you watch a lot of. You watch some TV. You go to the movies, but you work in the fields. You work. You bale hay. You detassel cord, you rogue beads, you you don't, uh, you know, it's impossible. It's impossible to get to Hollywood. You dream about it. You know, you talk about it. You daydream about it. You know, you get uh, the biggest thing of, of, that, of Hollywood that may come to your town is Andre the Giant. Yeah. Wrestling <laughs> occasionally comes to town. And, uh, you know, I did touch him. Uh, when, when Andre the Giant came to the Atoma Coliseum. I mean, wrestling is huge. Yeah, it, it's huge. And, and uh, I did uh, get away from my friends. And as he was walking out of the ring, I got up on top of the ropes. I don't recommend this in any sporting event. And propelled myself and got one finger on the great Andre the Giant. And then, of course, I got the crap beat out of me. And it was so worth it. And uh, but that's why you know you just you had you know I had dreams. I wanted to be on on television because I grew up with a single father. When 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 our dad was 22, I was four. My sister was three. And my brother was one, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and we always we always would tell dad he was boring because you know he'd go to work, he'd come home, you know, he'd play with us some, but uh, and we didn't think he was just very exciting. But as a as a single 61 year old father with a seven year old and a four year old, uh, I got I've gained a ton more respect uh, every day I think about him like how in the heck did he do this or that but you know I had I definitely had a dream there was something about and also my father the he laughed the t- the times that we heard him laugh downstairs when he got out for work was there when there was a Bob Hope special on it Bob Hope oh. was this great comic and he had had these specials in the 60s 70s 80s 90s until he passed away and Man, our dad would laugh hard, and we'd hear that. And we're like, "What? What is? What is this, Bob Hope? What does he do?" And I said, "I got to do whatever it is he does because he makes our dad laugh so hard." So I just wanted to go to Hollywood and and be on TV. And then I thought, well, a the people in our town will like me, which isn't true, but but I, I wanted to make my dad laugh. And so as I got a little bit older and. Uh, you know, I had to earn money to go to college. I wanted to go to college at the University of Iowa because, you know, also when you grow up in a town where everybody looks the same, yeah. everybody does the same thing. My grandpa had worked at the meatpacking plant for almost 50 years. My dad had worked there for a little bit. Everybody in our town worked at the meatpacking plant, at the slaughterhouse. And so after high school, I, I worked there uh, on the kill floor for three years. 
to and that's a you know that's one of those jobs where it was the best job in town it just was it paid the most you got benefits but uh you know and and, and to be honest you know you you actually you make your own fun there and i still have friends who are just about ready to retire that started what i did there nice guys uh but but it's it's a rough job let me tell you well, and, uh, it, it, you know, it, hey Tom, it, it reminds me a little bit of when you're when you're when you're talking about that, and this goes back to Gus Farratt, that you know, my friend who played in the NFL for a long time. I know him. I yeah, know him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, inter- he introduced us, yeah. and, and anyways, net net was was you know, here's a guy that grew up um, in Pennsylvania, and it's kind of like those steel mines, which are when you're talking about this, it's kind of like the same thing where your intent is just to start there, and then you get the golden handcuffs. And once you get going and it's the best job in town, like how do you break out of that? Yeah. Well, here's the thing about a meatpacking plant. You you know, your dreams are, it, it, my dreams were outside of there. As long as you keep that going. But but when you start there, you start in livestock, which is outside of the actual building. Your dream then is to get inside the building, the next job up, which is on the kill floor. And that's what happened. And then your dream is a little bit more, and so into Hambone, that's the next department. And then if you're, you know, your next dream is to get into the freezer and, and to work at the smoke shop. But most guys don't dream to get way, take, you know, a plane right. and go out of there. And I, and, and uh, but I, and then about the third year, I realized my dream, my, my dream, I thought, I'm just going to have to stay here. I'm not going to, I looked around, I saw guys that were happy there, which is, which is great, but they were all married. You had families and, uh, and uh, I thought, man, I, something's got to, you know, I just got to, you know, it, it's enticing. You know, you're like, wait a minute, what am I? That's crazy. How nobody can even, I couldn't even get to, to Hollywood. It, nobody's ever done that. How does that even happen? And, and uh, one night we went out drinking at our, our disco. And you just, it's, and and uh, afterwards, I, I, I went, I walked outside and there's a guy named Andy Kaufman standing yeah. there. And he was on, you know, he's on taxi. He's so funny. Yeah. And we'd had a women's uh, wrestling event at the Tumble Coliseum. That's where we had. And he'd showed up because he was studying uh, transcendental meditation in Fairfield, the next town over at uh, the Maharishi International University. He came and, and he paid the, 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 the women wrestlers to stay late so he could wrestle them. You know, he was doing all that stuff. Oh. And then he took everybody in the audience to Happy Joe's Pizza which it would be my dream. And I met him and I talked to him a little bit and I realized, holy cow, he got here to a tumble Iowa from Hollywood. So it has to be possible to get from a tumble Iowa to Hollywood. Now it's, that's, now it's possible. And that, that inspired me. And then I ended up going up to saving enough money to go to the university of Iowa where they had a stage an open by night. And plus everybody, I saw people from all over the world there. It is just eye opener. I loved it. And then it, everything became possible. I ended up uh, moving to uh, Minneapolis because someone over, offered me a $15 job and, uh, you know, with a bag, a trash bag full of clothes. But here's the thing. The fr- well, as soon as I got to Hollywood, well, the first job I did was a Bob Hope special. And uh, Bob Hope was so nice. He called my dad. And so my dad, the dream I had was that my dad would watch me with Bob Hope on that same TV in the same living room. And that happened. And, and, and it was exactly as I dreamed it. So wait, wait, every, wait, 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 wait. Let me just, so I'm, so I'm falling down this thread. Were you a writer on the show or were you actually on I stage? acted. I have pictures with me and Bob Hope. I, he played Robin Hood and I was one of his, uh, in the sketch as one of his very bad. Roseanne and I did it. And he called up my dad. He wrote all this stuff. And then I went on to be friends with Bob Hope. And I did the USO stuff. I still do the USO stuff. Yeah because of Bob Hope, and I spent time, I drove down to Palm Springs to visit him and his wife, and we became friends, and I did probably 20 different things with him, and, uh, and, and you know, my dad, you know, worshipped Bob Hope, everybody did, and then I'd call him up to come down and be on that when I was uh, executive producing the Roseanne Show and writing, I'd say, hey, what are you doing this afternoon, did you come down and do a little thing, and, you know, he'd be golfing over there at, uh, at uh, uh, the course of the valley there you go yeah you just stop over and do that and then we did a, a million other things together and he inspired me to do the uso stuff and you know i've been to afghanistan iraq all over okinawa i've been everywhere in the world uh, where there are uh, u.s troops and it's because of you know his inspiration and uh but you know exactly as i said and i i believe this 
I've been in over 100 movies, by the way. But every dream I've ever had has come true. From my children to every uh, a movie. Uh, uh, I've had started TV shows. My sports dreams. I wanted to be on a sports show. I bet all of my, most of my heroes, childhood heroes, I sat right next to them. These people would come on my sports show, and there were people that my grandpa and I would just sit and watch them and, and just, I, I, I mean, I had the sports show on Fox. I could not believe I was sitting next to uh, Willie Mays or, you know, Ernie Banks. I'm a Cub fan. I just could not believe it because it just took me back to my grandpa and I, how many games we we watched and how many you know, I mean, it, it is shocking. And it is shocking that, that, you know, the people I know, and it'll be from Iowa, that friends with Dan Gable, the greatest, uh, really the greatest coach of any kind ever. But, you know, a guy that the, you know, and I'm friends with these people. And, you know, it is, it is just, uh, but, but I believe that, you know, and I, let me just say one thing about you. My assistant, Sasha, who is, we have the podcast, she's 30 years younger. And I and she was telling me, I go, give me information on the fellow today. She goes, oh, uh, well, he played in the NFL. I, I go, I go, give me the best thing that you you can offer his bio. She goes, well, yeah, he was a football player, yeah. And then I, he climbed a, a mountain. I go, how many mountains? Seven. I go, is that a big deal? She goes, well, I think he's like, uh, I think the seven. I go, no, it's the seven. It's the <laughs> seven. But, but it's funny that she goes, the football is the big deal, she said. Yeah. I go, what about Sports Illustrated? Yeah, she goes, well, he's a podcast. He's got a podcast. That's a big deal. And he, he's an NFL that star. That's a big deal. And uh, it's funny what people see, but I go, those seven, because that is the seven. I, it, but it's all a big deal. But it's, so, but I, I, but my children are the biggest deal. So I'll let you talk now too. No, no, I appreciate that. Well, there, there was a lot in there. First of all, and we're going to bounce all over just because that's the way the conversation is going. One of the things that you and I have in town in common is in 1981, 1983, as you mentioned before, you went to the University of Iowa. I went to the University of Washington. I was on the football team playing for Don James, legendary coach, as you know. Great, and we ended yeah, great up- coach. And we ended up playing uh, Hayden Fry's Iowa team, Hawkeye, and we beat them in the 28-0 in the 1982 Rose Bowl. And, you yeah. know, t- t- talk about, you know, you talked about a little bit about guys like Andy Kaufman and other people coming to your town, and they really opened your eyes to what could actually be out there. And for me, when I went down to L.A., which I'd never been really before, I got to be in the Rose Bowl, uh, be a part of all that pageantry. And, by the way, we've been in the Rose Bowl the year before, played in Michigan, got beat. You know, it's just literally, um, I think the point to anybody out there is step outside your box. And it's amazing what's out there to raise the bar of where you're trying to go. And look at you, all these great things you've done. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, uh, Don James is a great, great, great coach. And uh, that game was, uh, that game sucked. But we got <laughs> to the road. The thing about Iowa, you know, uh, we had not been, uh, we, uh, before I was bored, we got in some Rose Bowls, and we did. We had a coach named Four Seven Chesky, and we were amazing. But once I was born, we were on a dry, dry. We still went to the games, man. My grandpa, starting uh, when I was uh, five years old, nineteen uh, uh, sixty-five, I started going to the games. With my grandpa, it was wonderful because my grandpa was a big sports fan. He's a big. He's a referee and umpire in Iowa, and, and everybody knew him. He did thousands of games. Him and his partner, who's in the Hall of Fame in Iowa. And so I love just being with him because everybody knew him, but he was a very tough guy. You know, we're Jewish and uh, there's not a lot of that, especially at the meatpacking plant. And, you know, I worked at a pork processing plant. And so, you know, but he, but he's a, he was a guy that it would, he would he'd mix it up with people, but I worship my, my grandfather and, but just the whole spirit of Kinnick stadium, but we really did it win many games. And, uh, then, then Hayden Fry came to town. And this is how people, they, they change. Sports is important. I just want to say this. And, and because until then, we weren't winning stuff. And I was working at the beat packing plant when Hayden Fry came. And, uh, you know, uh, and he this guy comes and he's a character. And he's from Texas. And he's selling this stuff. And he's very Texan. And he's a... Uh, has these little uh, uh, sayings and stuff. And, and he's like, you just got to believe. He does, you know, he's scratch where it is. He just, it's so different than Iowa. You know, we're pretty, 
I was pretty conservative and uh, very, you know, Protestant, very conservative. Everybody's, uh, you know, and uh, but he's selling this thing. And, and we've been sold some before, but there's something different about him. So everybody's kind of buying in. And man, they start winning. And I'll tell you this. At the Meat Peggy Platt, it changed our quality of life. We were happier boning hams or, or uh, you know, what, what chiseling heads. I can tell you right now, the breaks in the break room were just, it lifted us up. And we're just, it, it's a hard job there, especially on the kill floor. We were happier. We were happier when we went out to drink it afterwards, which we were just, it just lifted us up, man. You know, sports always lifted us up in, in the plant. You know, when Bucky Dead hit that home run or whatever, but the vibe of the whole state because of Hayden Fry coming and stuff. And, you know, even that Super or uh, Rose Bowl we lost, Iowa went to Iowa Travels. We went all out there and we didn't care. We, we lost the game, but when Iowa went out there, I know you coming to LA and uh, you Washington pe- folks. But I know it's new, but to Iowans, they came out early and they stayed. And they stayed when you lost. Uh, the last time I was, we were, uh, we were at the Rose Bowl, I was, I'm just going to tell you a brief story. Yeah. They said they took an alumni from Iowa and Stanford. And they said, we want, uh, so it was Condoleezza Rice, of course, alumni from Stanford. And so she's going to say a, a, something from the field of, about how great Stanford is. And then Tom Arnold was going to represent the Hawkeyes. So, she went first, said something beautiful, and then uh, and then I was going to go as soon as there was a break in the action and speak about being an Iowa Hawkeye. Well, uh, they they come down and Stanford scores, and uh, uh, Christian McCafferty, uh, I believe, <laughs> and then uh, you know, as soon as there's a break in the action, uh, we'll come to you, Tom. The reporters that are with me, and then Stanford scored again, and then just uh, just be a moment. Then Stanford scores again, and then they run back. And then there's a fumble, and then they score again. And by the time they got to me, I think it was 35 to 7. I was standing there, and everybody <laughs> could see, and it was the funniest thing. And I thank God I talked to the team before the game because there, there's no way. And uh, and I did said this thing that's pretty, it's pretty famous about we got to right where we want them, Hawkeyes, because we were getting crushed. And then I went up in the stands, and and I did not go in the locker room, but, and everybody, every old Iowa player, Everyone I knew, we stayed the whole. So we had so much fun, and they just. And, and there was once where where the 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 McCaffrey kid ran right by me on the sideline, and it was. And they, they were focused on me standing there. The late, the Fox ladies like, please don't leave. We're so sorry. I go, no. It if it had been close, it it might have been awful. But we just they just kept. And that's the thing about being from Iowa. You, ch- you probably aren't going to win the the number one, and it's okay as long as you're, you know. And, and you, game, you just got to fight on, man. Yeah, you well, know. two things. You know, number one, Christian McCaffrey is a great player for sure. Yes, yes phenomenal, he is. phenomenal talent. And number two, I knew when all those, you, you know, like you said, we we would go and do Disneyland together and Magic Mountain together and Knott's Berry Farm together in terms of uh, the Iowa team and the the Husky team. And, um, you know, so we saw all these, these players walking around and they were just bright eyed and bushy tailed. And I just knew we were going to fry them. And we'd been there the year before and we got smoked by, by Michigan. So, I mean, I knew what it was that like, but the nicest people on the planet, it was so, I mean, it was just a great experience. Obviously we won, but it was a great experience too, because we were there the year before and lost. So it's just, you know, it's, it's a once in a lifetime thing. If you're school, you guys won you know, because you're so much better than us on the field. I mean, it was, uh, you guys are just so much better than us. There's no other way to put it. I remember after the game, uh, we we're, we were talking, and my grandpa and everybody had uh, tried to go, well, what was the deal? And my grandpa was like, they were just so much better. Yeah. <laughs> we were, that's it. There's no other way to put it. They were so much better than we were. And, you know, once in a while, you just have to say that. And uh, I had a friend that played for the St. Louis uh, Blues, Jeff. Courtnell and uh, the uh, Red Wings. They played the Red Wings in the playoffs, and I went to uh, a bunch of ga- bunch of games. And uh, and uh, he was like, uh, I was like, man, that was uh, it's too bad you couldn't have. Uh, he, I go, what do you think the deal was? He goes, well, they, it's just that they are so much better than we are. People don't usually admit that, but sometimes it just you know is. some days it's just that. It's like, a, oh, if we just I know they are just so much better. But that day, 
you know, it was very clear and it could have been worse. <laughs> That's the only thing. Hey, I got I, I got I, I this is again, going off topic a little bit, but going back to your, your, your comment about Andy Kaufman, and this is just my own curiosity because I, I did watch him on Saturday Night Live and just all the skits he used to do. Was he, was he different in person? Cause he had that really quirky side that he would portray on television and people didn't know if he was serious or not. And the whole wrestling thing that was in there. Well, he was very sweet, you know, very sweet guy. I think that uh, all those were, you know, he's a very sweet guy. I mean, he's very brave. I mean, obviously Jerry Lawler was in on, he was very brave and uh, those were characters and obviously the wrestling people do it, you know, yeah. I mean, everybody, you know, he, he, anytime you, and I know this from, you know, these wrestlers, I mean, anytime, he, and wrestlers know this from wrestling other wrestlers, you get in, get involved there. It's a, you can get hurt. And uh, uh, the, the, the wrestling women, you get hurt. But, you know, he was, uh, everybody was aware. It was a good thing for wrestling. And it was a good thing for, but it was a character. He wanted to play a heel. And, uh, you know, I grew up with that type of wrestling. I, you know, worship all those guys, but yeah. And then the sweet, the uh, Mickey, the all those characters. That the he just was a different kind of comic, yeah. and uh, he played those different characters, and pr- it was very brilliant. You know, uh, he was, uh, you know, but but sometimes people get, you know, if they're used to a certain kind of comic, they get upset. But he's never broke character, which he was so brilliant. Yeah, but no, I, I gotta say, he treated people in my hometown. He wrestled because you want to get better at wrestling yeah. uh, women because it's, it, he came to the right place because the, the women where I'm from are tough. They're as tough as boys. Girl, girls sports are way more supported than boys sport. We The state tournament when I was growing up uh, in basketball, softball, way more popular. And, you know, the girls, and I'll speak for my sisters, you know, they work uh, just as right next to the five brothers, man, and they – you know, and they're and they're and the the girls I went to school with, you know, there's no, uh, not no, none of that. I mean, they, you know, if a father dies on a farm and they're and the, the, the daughter is, is 14, 15, 16, they have to take over. It's not like, you know, it's like, well, the girl is this and the girl's that. No, it's not. And you see, uh, FFA, Future Farm of America. There's the, the girls are in there, and 4-H. If you go to State Fair, it's the same. It, it was that that day that back then for sure so a uh, tumble iowa when he went to the uh to the uh, wrestling to wrestle the women's uh that, that was the perfect place i'll tell you you one of my favorite shows of all time and i couldn't figure it out when i first started watching was the best damn sports show period yeah right? and so and the reason why i say that is just because you'd had some some good success in in, in television and, and especially in the movies and now they bring you in, and and I think you were in there with three or four other guys, John Sally, the basketball player, and there's another host that's gone on to Fox or something, but you were really good, and it surprised me of, like, your acumen of how much sports knowledge you guys had. That's one, and then you mentioned this at the very beginning, is this the, your, your, your ability, just because your stage you're on, of attracting all these amazing athletes that would come in and and – you know, you guys would get to interview and it was just really well done, really well done. And you were there three or four years. I, well, I, we, we had, uh, I mean, what a gift to, to go and talk about sports, which I love sports. I've always considered my drug of choice. It's, uh, you know, sports are more fair than life. I always say, because there's a beginning, middle and end. There's yeah. no fake news. You can't, I mean, I mean, you just go out and then you watch it and then, Miracles happen too. You know, I, I, I tell my son, don't. It's never over until it's over. And the miracle, you know, we watch, you know, we watch games sometimes. And uh, you know, I was telling Gus there was a Vikings game a couple years ago. We're watching it, and it's over. It's over. And then I forget which quarterback makes a crazy throw at the end. And there's a million times. I'm a New York yeah. Giants fan. Yeah. You know, we uh, 2000 the game the Super Bowl in 2008, man. The 2000 uh, the, when they were playing uh, the, the, I don't know, the, the Buccaneers, uh, Trent Dilfer, no, who they were playing. T- Trent Dilfer was quarterback in the Super Bowl. I forget what year. And uh, we went down. Baltimore. I'm friends with, what? which one was it? Baltimore Ravens, I believe. Trent. Yeah. Yep. So I go, you know, I'm friends with the Tish family, uh, you know, who is co-owner. And uh, uh, old man Tish was alive then. 
Bob Tish, who I, lo I love. And, you know, Zach Tish is my godson. That's Steve's, Steve's uh, uh, a son. And so but, but Bob Tish and I went to that. To, we went to a few Super Bowls together. And we had a lot of fun. And anyway, so I go down there to uh, Tampa and uh, and I ride to the, that, the game on the team bus with all the Everybody's like, we got this, and everybody's like, we're the crazy guys, and we, much like Iowa did to, from watching, we got destroyed. <laughs> and so I wouldn't even get back on the bus to ride to the hotel, to the Tish Hotel in Orlando. I honestly, pretty much hitchhiked. I was watching cars come out of the parking lot. I'm like, hey, are you guys heading towards Orlando? Because everybody was so bummed out. But then in in, uh, in, in 2008, down in Scottsdale, we're playing the Patriots undefeated. And man, but we've been kind of close to them in our last game, though. But there's no way we're going to win, so nobody cared. So we just hang it out. Everybody's having fun, and uh, and uh, I, mean, I was in the box with uh, everybody that had a minute and a half left. And this is this is I say this is how God works, and I beat it. And all of a sudden, uh, Eli Manning, he never gets away from anybody. And the guy said his shirt, and I'm like, there's no, and he, the, that crazy. Uh, uh, and he gets it to Dave Tyree, who can't. That's crazy. That's impossible. I start looking down there, and you know, I'm with uh, the, the Americans who are, uh, you know, some of them are big time actors now. And I'm like, what? And then, you know, uh, Plaxico, he still has to throw the ball to Plaxico, and it, it just erupts. I took Mayor Bloomberg, this is the truth. If you ever have him on here, oh. and threw him up, he's very small, yeah. and threw him up oh. into the ceiling. <laughs> and we were, we just blasted down to the, to the to the field and i don't think any of us had our our passes you know how hard it is to get on the field yeah. you know sports illustrated get down there but if you don't have your passes it's 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 tougher than they're tougher than the secret service man but i got and, and the bear kids didn't have anything and we just blasted through and got on the field because the joy and the when you're not sitting there a lot of games i watch i'm so nervous because i'm like oh it's my team like the the seventh game of the World Series in 2016. I'm like, I had diarrhea because I was so worried about the Cubs screwing it up. Like, I just, but this game was the best game because I was like, we aren't going to win. Let's have fun. It's not, it's impossible. And then, but you know, that's the gift of sports. You have a team, you root for these teams, you have that in common with people that don't think like you think politically, especially in this, this awful, uh, you know, and you walk through an airport, you know, people go, hey, go Hawks to me because. And I go, yeah, I have something in common with you. And they'll go, go Michigan. And I'll go, I have something <laughs> not in common with you. I want to, you know, but it's that fun sports, uh, that sports thing. Because if they, if, also, if you love sports, if you really ha love sports and you have a team, you know that you, you, you are going to lose sometimes and, and you can shake hands and you got something, you get riled up about something with somebody and not, and go, okay. Well, we're going to do it again next year, aren't we? Or we're going to do it later this year, oh. and then I'm going to get you. You don't go, well, <laughs> I want you dead, or I want yeah, you yeah, to, yeah. you know, and you can take losing. You know how to take losing. And so it's a, you know, a Jimmy Carter, when he was in the White House, he was a, uh, a Braves or a Red Sox fan. I forget what he told me. He came out my sports show. And it did affect his quality of life if his team lost for a minute or so, because <laughs> it does hurt. It does hurt hurt for a second if you don't care for a moment then you really aren't a sports if it doesn't put a little twinge in you oh. then uh but but if you don't care about sports at all then you shouldn't be the president of the united states that's what i say <laughs> that's what that's me so is there you one is, is, is there one uh of all the interviews that you did over time is there one interview that still stays with you in terms of that was just amazing you probably weren't even talking about sports or maybe it was, it was just a very emotional moment with anybody. I mean, you guys had a lot of people on. Well, you know, John Crook was our baseball guy. I loved him. Michael Irvin was our football guy. Loved him. Chris Rose was the, was the, the uh, host. He the said, host. all those guys have done so well. You know, we did a lot of, of different kinds of things. You know, my sister had been in prison for, uh, you know, she was a, drug dealer and uh you know she's my little sister and uh and uh it was her second stint and the first time uh she got arrested you know i i i helped her and she got a i went to a good prison uh in west virginia the the place that martha stewart had gone and you know i was able to call her there and uh, 
it's a camp, a prison camp, you know, and yeah, pretty swanky for, you know, and I uh, go down there and speak to the, uh, to the women about uh, my recovery. You know, I'm also a recovering addict and, uh, and there was you know, nothing like speaking at a women's prison. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, you talk about getting, uh, you know, making you feel, making me feel good. Cause they, uh, and then, uh, and then I had her set up with a job at the bee packing plant, the best job in a tumble, by the way, wow. that's a good job. And, uh, you know, I'd work with, uh, that be, I'd become friends with the DEA, the, the agents that originally had arrested her and her, uh, she was, old, she's a, the queen of meth and they're, you know, they're making a movie about her. And, uh, and uh, so I said, this, you got the job there. You don't do this, that. And, you know, we'd uh, I'd, uh, help raise her son, who was seven when his parents went to prison. And, uh, and his dad had, ended up dying in Leavenworth. But it's also, and then the, the guy from the DA called and said, hey, she's dealing again. If she stops re- really right away, we'll, we'll let her off. So I flew to Ottawa where we're from. I got the my other six brothers and sisters, uh, five, six, counting her. We all met at the photo uh, studio, Dury's photo, and take a picture for our dad. And, uh, and then as we walked out of there, I said, Lori, you know, I talked to the sheriff and the <clears throat> DA and, the, and everybody, they know you're dealing. And if you stop right now, you won't be arrested. And, and she said, she told me to mind my effing business. And then the next week they raided her things just like they did last time. And she went to prison. And I said, this prison, this has got to be a real prison with a uh, component of rehabilitation, a drug rehabilitation component, but it's got to be real. And so she got 10 more years and, uh, and uh, I did not visit her for the first uh, maybe three years. And, and my show, we, we filmed me going to visit her for the first time. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, my show was, a, it was, it was uh, trying to pay, keep things a little light. And it was as light as possible. My sister always was had a way of making things funny or whatever. But you know, it was a it was a real women's prison, and uh, I, I I I'm grateful that got to do that. And uh, because you know, I was also. But from then on, we we communicated a lot. So it was probably uh, good that that happened. And then she's been since so she's got out. You know, she's been. Uh, Knock on wood. <laughs> she's been doing, you know, she's still a biker. She's still, but uh, but she's been doing, uh, we've communicated a lot. The, this, the Discovery Channel's filming a, a documentary series about her, but really legitimate documentaries uh, about her and uh, the uh, our hometown. I'm going back next week and do a couple of days and just about what happened to the, the economy and what, how this, this could have happened. And, you know, I feel comfortable uh, doing that and, how that we grew up and what, what our mother was like, like who had disappeared and whatever, and then came back and took my sister. And uh, my sister got married when she was 14 to this biker and says, whatever. And I bless that our life at the same time that I kind of went to Hollywood, she went this way and started uh, buying drugs from the Mexican mafia and then became the biggest methamphetamine dealer in America. And so I went to, Hollywood, and we're just uh, you know, but for the grace of God, uh, go I because I was a I used drugs, and uh, I just could I just I could never sell them because I used them. So uh, you know, it's about you know uh, we we there's uh, anyway my sports show we yeah. went there and uh, no, that's incredible. Yeah. What I was going to say, I think a lot of times one of these things work, and I think one of the things I really respect about you is when you when you when you sprinkle in this thing called vulnerability, right? Where you're mm-hmm. you're ready to expose yourself. You've discussed your things in the past. The name of the show is called Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their flipping way. And I've gone through my yeah. stuff, and we've all gone through. And I think the yeah. the gift is is when you can step up to the plate and say, "Look, this is me. This is who I am. This is what happened." And I'm better for it today, but I had to go through it. I didn't go around it. I'd go through it. And, and, you know, you just, you know, we all learn there's no perfect course and that's what makes you who you are, which I think is pretty cool. Let me ask you this. I have, I, yeah. I have yeah. so much respect for what you've done. I just can't, you've done, you've done five lifetimes at least of, I just can't, I can't get my head around the things that you have done. And you're at, and you're still doing it. I just can't. 
I just can't imagine. But but well, well, but, you know the ahead. thing. The thing, Tom. You know that I I you know when I was going through some some of my own personal battles, you know, ten years ago, and I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, home of the Huskies, as you know. And um, so growing up there in the Northwest and all the mountains, I said, you know, I'm going to start climbing the seven summits and try to become the first NFL player to ever do so. And that's, you know, that has like nature has my part of my healing has been going out. I live in Sun Valley, Idaho now, and I walk out and I hug a tree every day, you know, and see butterflies Mm -hmm. going through. And so my whole focus on things that I used to maybe not be focused on, it's just Mm -hmm. brought a whole calming effect around everything that I'm trying to do. And I'm not quite there. I still have one more mountain to go. But the best thing you can do, and this is something you've done such a terrific job at, is just keep stepping up to the plate and swinging the bat. And you just don't know where that's going to go versus playing it safe all the time. One of the movies, I I just wanted to uh, bring this up really quick because it was one of my favorite movies that you've done. Just a great movie in general, but you happen to be in it, um, is True Lies. And uh, your good buddy, I'm sure Arnold Schwarzenegger has a big place here. Just a couple of miles. Yeah, he FaceTimed me from the, the other day. He faced, I knew I knew you lived out there, and uh, he. How close is he to you? He's close to you, right? Oh, we're we're a mile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Go, there's a place yeah. I, I I know. Yeah, yeah. So he FaceTimed. Uh, he FaceTimed. Arnold's True Lies is a good movie because of me mostly. But True <laughs> Lies is. Uh, let me explain this. Of uh, of the hundred and maybe twenty movies I've done, True Lies was really the first. And, and it's so I'm so lucky because I filmed it during my last year of my marriage to Rosanna. I was doing the show, come back and forth, and uh, and we when we got divorced, it was it was a big deal, and it was oh. not uh, not so you know people because she's a big star on the show, and I lost my job on the show. Uh, weirdly enough, the same day she filed for divorce, and uh, they weren't like going well. <clears throat> we like both of these guys. We'll work with both of them. They they were like. She was like, if you ever work with him again, you'll never see me again. So I didn't think my prospects for jobs were were too good. But Jim Cameron, the director, and Arnold were like, forget those people. When they when True Lies comes out in two months, everybody's gonna be blown away. And you'll be and I was like, I wish I could believe it, but it really did. It uh it's it it changed my life and just the opportunity to work on this film. I had no idea how big of a deal it was, or I probably would have been freaked out every day, but it's a movie that uh, I got to play basically myself and my relationship with with Arnold in real life, and uh, you know it was a uh, it was the highest price movie ever at the time, and uh, and I didn't even think about that, and and James Cameron he trusted me, uh, you know I went to uh, I, I my agent thought we were going to leave the the agency, so he said oh I got you an audition for this James Cameron movie. Uh, True Lies, and I, I knew it was, uh, he called it a favor. And I, I, I was too embarrassed. I said, no, 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 I, I'm too embarrassed. He, he won't, doesn't want me. You asked him to do you a favor. And I almost didn't even go. But then I thought, well, you know, I won't ever get to meet James Cameron. This will be my chance. So I went over to his house, and, and then we chit-chatted. He was very nice. And I'm such a fan for the Terminator movies and everything. And, and so I, he goes, well, are you going to do the scene? I go, I didn't even read it. I go, I just wanted to meet you. I know you don't want me to. He goes, well, just read it off this paper. And I, I just, uh, okay. I read it once. He goes, hey, the, get Arnold down here. And that's what how it happened. And Arnold Schwarzenegger came down the, the, the steps. And I was like, oh, shoot. There he is. I go, look at him. And I said to, to, to James Cameron, I go, I think I can take him. <laughs> and I was serious, like I, I, you know, yeah, you size guys up, and uh, then we did a scene together, and, J- and James goes, "Give me my camera," and he films us do it one more time, and uh, he goes, "Turn his camera down." He goes, "Listen, you got the part." And I go, "Oh my god!" But don't tell anybody for two weeks, and I was like, "Oh, I swear to God, I won't." Oh no, I, I, I won't tell a soul the best news of my life for two weeks. You can count on me. And I go, "I got to go to my car." So I went to my car. I tell everybody, call everybody. Yeah. Nobody believes it. And uh, and uh, because you know he had to give Fox uh, Films uh, the bad news, but and he had to talk him. He had to just say it's uh, they they didn't want me to move it. He goes, well then I'll make it a pair about it. It went like that. But he told me the reason he cast me is because when, when I saw Arnold, I said I think I could take him. He said that was why he cast me because that's the character he wanted. Then it was like I was like looking at him like seriously, signed him up like yeah, I think I could take him. Like James Cameron, by the way, is a six foot three. 
Rob Ode, uh, Canadian. Like oh. he's a he's a, he's that guy. But I love Arnold so much. You know, he's been a really great friend. And, and uh, you know, he was the first person in the, the the delivery room of my son, my seven year old seven year old son was born. You know, he loved, my kids would we FaceTime the other day. And they love it. My son has posters of Arnold Schwarzenegger in his bedroom, <laughs> and not just, just the bodybuilding stuff. And and uh, you know, he let like, kids love True Lies, and uh, they don't watch. They watch some of my movies, but uh, that movie we stayed friends. Jamie Lee Curtis is yeah, still she, a friend. I think uh, she's. I've seen her around here a little bit. I think she might have a place up here. Yeah, and we write each other dirty uh, notes. Uh, we we're doing a Zoom a charity event the other night, and you know how you can write each other personal yeah. <laughs> things. But, uh, I love her, James Cameron. You know, uh, you know what a gift to be able to. Uh, can you imagine me that time? That's nothing. I am friends with. You know, when we started that movie, before we started, Jim Cameron's like, hey, would you would like, uh, would you like Arnold to, to go over to your house and work out with you? And I go, yeah. Yeah, I really would like the greatest bodybuilder of all time to <laughs> come to my personal gym. And so he worked out. And then, and then uh, the next day, the, the Jim Cameron's like, what time would you like Arnold to come over tomorrow and work out with you? And I go, yeah, I don't want him to. And, she, and he goes, why? <laughs> I go, because number one, I could say I, trained with the greatest bodybuilder that ever lives. So I got that. Number two, it's too much pressure because he really looks at my body. And, uh, you know, the first thing Arnold does, he sizes you up and then he, he has to give you one compliment. He's like, <clears throat> you know, Tom, you have a fantastic uh, right calf. You know, and, and then I go, and then he starts in on my trouble spots because he genuinely tries to help me. And it is, I got a lot of trouble spots. So the whole movie, he had a semi-truck trailer with a gym in it, like a super, and then I would go to Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and but then by the middle of the movie, ah. I had I had I had, he started eating ice cream with me and quit working out, and that's a friendship because I had drug him down a little bit. And, uh, but you know he's a he he he's a killer man. He gets up at four thirty every day and works out, and and uh, I do we do a lot of charity stuff together, and then he's he, he Arnold Schwarzenegger lives his life like he's running for office all the time. That's that's the best way I can describe him. You know, and I've had so much fun when he was governor going up and, and uh, you know, just <laughs> being, being semi-involved in that and sometimes too involved. And, yeah. uh, you know, you know his people having to explain things. And, you know, he's, he, he gets a little mischief himself, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I love him. I love it, man. I love it. Well, you you tell him anytime he wants to get a phenomenal workout. I run up and down the mountains every day with Jim Mora. So uh Oh, do know. you really? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like Jim Mora a lot. Jim, Jim's here I in like town. Him. So we we will punish him. Tell him that. Tell the Terminator we will punish. Let me ask you one last question. What is the the best thing and the worst thing about having your kind of celebrity in Hollywood? Well, you know, I, I'd hate to complain about anything that I dreamt about as a kid. Um, yeah. uh, no, I, about casting. Oh, no, that's Tom Arnold doesn't do. Oh, no. To, to go, that people think they know what you do. And, well, he does this kind of a role because they've seen you at a, a bunch of movies where he did that. Or when you read that they're casting a Tom Arnold type, but younger. Yeah, <laughs> than, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, uh, they're, or they're... You know, I remember when uh, after True Lies, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I think it was, and Brad Pitt and, and, and uh, yeah. Angelina Jolie, yeah. that movie, and then Vince uh, Vaughn was me. And they were Arnold and uh, 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 Jamie Lee Curtis. And I'm like, dude, that he is playing me, and they are playing those guys. Or, But then they'll, they'll say in the casting, you know, uh, like a Tom Arnold or the director will say, you know, I want you to be like, and after True Lies, a lot of people tried to... Uh, to do movies like that. And, uh, you know, I, I get a lot of, uh, people are, you know, they, you, you on, on, on the internet people, there's a lot of trolls and, uh, and, uh, you know, people go, well, he's never done anything. He's just done a Roseanne, but then they'll, you know, they'll go, well, except for this movie or that movie or Austin Powers or this or that or this. And, uh, but you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't trade. I'd rather be, I'm a, I, I am, sure that i am very well known i'm sure that i'm very famous for a whether it be soul plate or 
to different audiences, uh, people people are definitely, you know, it's it's a blessing. I'm I'm blessed. By the way, Jim Mora, we had a clip of him that we played almost every day on the sports show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I I'm just picturing it, but he'll know what it is because we played it every day. At, at, uh, and, and it was up there with Alan Iverson's practice, but uh, something about uh, oh my god, I gotta remember that we played it every day. You're I talking about was, playoff, uh, playoffs, playoffs. Yeah, playoffs, playoffs. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes. It is the funniest. You talk about playoffs. Yeah. It is yeah, the funniest. It, so that's Jim Moore. It. Yeah, so that's Jim Moore Senior. He was my coach, and I am buddies. Yeah. The guy who I'm running up and down the mountains with is Jim Moore Junior. Oh, you were Jim Moore Junior. Oh, he's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I love both. That's a great family that's great yeah. <laughs> yeah well they're both amazing i was gonna say if jim moore seniors run up the hill no he's not saying right he's playing no. golf no 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 jim moore seniors playing golf in palm desert how old is jim moore jr uh we're the same age 58 oh. yeah well you're a little bit younger than me barely yeah. Yeah. barely yeah yeah you got me just by hair right. well thank you yeah hey listen thank dude I, I i so appreciate you coming on i am today. gonna tell arnold that i am gonna tell arnold that i I'll hook you guys up. Oh, that'd be great. Love to have them on the pod. And, like, you know, we work out every day, twice a day. We've got Everest coming up. And it's, you know, it's it's two a day. It's going hardcore. So you would appreciate it. All right. Don't kill him. Don't kill him. <laughs> Don't kill him. <laughs> All right, man. Listen, thank you so much. He is the one and only Tom Arnold. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.